who, among other things, is a photographer, writer, multimedia artist, and historian. She is currently a resident scholar at the Brandeis University uh, Women's Research Study Center and is the official house historian for the Parker House in Boston. Uh, she is a recipient of a BA and an MA from uh, Tufts University. And her uh, books have included uh, Heaven by Hotel Standards, the history of the Omni Parker House, Boston Sights and Insights, a book that I always find helpful, um, The Literary Trail of Greater Boston, uh, Garden of Memory, um, which is about uh, the story of Forest Hill Cemetery and a brief history of Boston Press. And she is a consultant to numerous walking tour organizations in call, including uh, Boston by Foot, the Woman, the Heritage Trail, the Women's Heritage Trail in Boston, um, the um, African American Trail, the National, uh, the, the Freedom Trail. She's really been an enormous, wonderful resource for uh, people who uh, lead tours or, or go on tours. So, um, you know, I, we're really excited to hear from Susan. And um, without further ado, I give you Susan Wilson. Okay, so rather than look at my face, I'm going to share the screen. Um, Dermot, do you need to hit that for me or do I just? I think you should be able to do it. Okay. Let me know if there's a problem. It says host disabled attendee screen sharing. <laughs> uh, interesting. Uh, I see that. Um, here we go. Okay. Try it again. Aha. That's right. There you go. Aha. I'm liking that. Uh, hold on. What am I doing? Hold on, we're, we're gonna get this. I do have the backup, Susan, too. Okay. We're So it seems to be showing uh, like an enlarged version of it on my screen. Okay. Yeah, Is... that's better. Yeah. How's this? Are we there? There we go. We're there. Okay. All right. Great. Um, anyway, I want to thank Ed and Dermot and uh, the uh, <clears throat> old Swam for sponsoring this this evening. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Oh, I, you, I can't hear you. I, I'm going to pretend that everything's okay. Ed and Dermot? Yes, I can oh, hear you. Good? Okay. Yep. And we'll be muting everyone else now. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so to get started, um, there you go, Susan. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the talk tonight is based on um, a plate that I did in a book. The Atlas of Boston History, which was edited by Nancy S. Seashulls. I believe that Nancy's in the audience tonight, so I'm hoping we hear from her later. And uh, this was a book um, that was put I'm together. Here. Oh, she's there. Okay. Hi, Nancy. <laughs> um, this was a book that came out uh, just about a year ago, and uh, it basically uh, gives the entire history of Boston in maps and stories. And uh, some three dozen different scholars uh, uh, joined Nancy in putting this together and uh, put together a series of plates, um, uh, essentially chapters, but each one's a spread that tells the story of something. And we are talking about going from uh, the last, um, the end of the ice age in Boston up to the modern day uh, and all kinds of stories, dozens of stories about Boston. And um, I was lucky enough to do two different chapters 
And this is one of the plates that I did. Uh, this story is based on that. Uh, Nancy told me that today we are allowed to mention that the Atlas um, Historic New England's Book Prize for the year. Um, the best in history and material culture. So this is an official announcement that uh, the book has just been honored. So I'm thrilled to be part of this. Now, if you see here in the book, um, I just this is just a sampler from the table of contents. There are all kinds of different stories in here. Um, this is just this isn't even everything that's in the book right now, but it involves immigration and metropolitan Boston and uh, etc. The two chapters that I wrote, um, one is on the first page, literary Boston. And this is based on <clears throat> research I had done for the Boston History Collaborative and Houghton Mifflin for the Literary Trail of Greater Boston. And then there's one, uh, the one we're going to see tonight segments from is Enterprising Women, um, which I did in collaboration with members of the Boston Women's Heritage Trail. So let's get started with the story. Um, and the story I'm telling you tonight is going to be both more and less than you will find in the Atlas. Um, less because there are some 58 different women and women's organizations that are in this plate, and I don't have time to talk about 58 of them, and more because the ones that I'm selecting um, will in fact have more stories about them and more images, so you'll get a, a little deeper sense of some of these women. So I wanna start with our friend Abigail Adams. Uh, back in 1776, of course, she was a great correspondent <laughs> with her husband, John Adams, and uh, one of her most famous quotes, and by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. So good old Abigail. And uh, this was her morning to John. He was down there uh, in Philadelphia uh, working out, uh, you know, the new countries. Uh, the new country's laws, the constitution, etc. cetera. Um, John and the guys forgot, um, unfortunately, uh, to include the women at that time. Um, and as it turned out, uh, American women did not get the right to vote in federal elections until 1920. And of course, even then, many women were still disenfranchised, but in general, uh, or many, many women, uh, especially white women in America, got the opportunity to, to vote starting in 1920. So they were somewhat hobbled prior to then. This is one of my favorite images. I just love the women on the right. Um, it's, I don't know if I like, I like the instrument better or the dental work. Well, anyway, uh, uh, a great mo momentous thing, and this of course is being celebrated all this year because we are at the centennial of our getting the right to vote. Now, here's the thing. What did women do before that? Were they hobbled? Were they not able to do anything at all? Um, if you don't have the vote, how, what kind of influence do you have? Um, so what was it like for women? And I'm looking at the six decades prior to that time, okay? Um, in the middle of the 19th century, there was something in America that was known as the cult of true womanhood, <clears throat> sometimes known as the cult of domesticity. And this affected uh, this was something that was accepted by uh, middle and upper class women um, uh, and, and all of culture, it, it, well, accepted. I'm not, not sure it was accepted by everyone, but everyone knew that it existed. And part of the cult of true womanhood said that women had co four cardinal virtues that set them apart from the male species. And those were piety, purity, submissiveness, and <laughs> domesticity. Now, how Basically, at that time, and again, this did not include women of the lower classes, women, uh, working women didn't have the opportunity to even have this, although this, this idea somewhat hobbled them. It was the women's sphere and the men's sphere. The women's sphere was the domestic sphere, and women were supposed to stay within in that sphere, and that was home, taking care of children, taking care of the home, the cooking, etc. Men's sphere was outside of that, okay? And this was the sphere where you made money and grew and expanded and traveled, whatever. Um, and they were not supposed to intersect. Women had a very specific place they were supposed to be, and so did men. Uh, if you wanna see this visually, here's the women's sphere, and here's the men's sphere, okay? <laughs> All right, so 
basically part of the cult of true womanhood was that women were on a pedestal. They were adored, they were perfect, they were the humanizing force. You know, the man had to be humanized, he had to come home and be taken care of by the woman who, who made him into a, uh, a civilized human. But in the meantime, he was out in the other world. So here's, woman on a pedestal is an idea that's been in art for, for ages, okay? The idea of the idealized woman, of her sitting there, you look up and go, oh, how perfect she is. And here we have, you know, a cameo of her. And we, here we have her with her little children sitting there in her domestic sphere, okay? And this goes well into the 20th and 21st century where women are still put on pedestals, okay? Uh, this is one of my favorite favorites. Every man wants his woman on a pedestal, okay? Yeah, this is swell. All right, now. Some people thought, oh, that's an honor. That's a wonderful place to be. Many other people, especially women, went, hmm, if I'm on a pedestal, I'm not going to get things done. I can't do stuff like what's depicted, depicted in these images. Um, it's very much a constraint, as is staying within the domestic sphere. Um, however, if women strayed out of that sphere, they were called, and these are things, this is, this is not a one-time word use. These were all over papers, newspapers, magazines, books. Women were called manly or unsexed if they wanted to go to get higher education, uh, have careers, life in the men's own uh, public sphere. This is, is Carrie Nation, but I think she, um, she depicts what they thought women were like if they went into the men's sphere. Um, Despite all that, despite all that, and this is the basis of my plate in the Atlas, um, between the Civil War and the beginning of World War I, so basically 1862 to 1914, there were many, many enterprising women in Boston. They didn't have the vote, but they did get a lot done. Here's an image of the plate. And as in all the plates in the books, it's a spread, it has some kind of a map, and then images and text, uh, and in this case, lots of little dots that indicate various women, what they did, uh, various women's organizations, and how they kind of broke the mold, despite the fact that these women were disenfranchised. And uh, this just shows you in the back of the book, explanations of lots of more women so you can refer and get much more detail on uh, various women. And there's also a bibliography if you want to pursue any individual stories. But women in Boston were uh, pretty amazing. In 1880 and 1881, the definitive history of Boston was written by Justin Windsor. And this is an image of his four and uh, the ancient history of Boston was volume one, two, and three, but all the contemporary stuff up to 1880, 81 was in volume four. And in the 1881 edition, they have chapters like science in Boston, medicine in Boston, education in Boston, uh, politics in Boston. Uh, and there's an entire chapter about women. And the first sentence is, when an English gentleman was asked what seemed to him the most remarkable thing in Boston, he promptly answered, the women, okay? <laughs> so uh, this wasn't something that was noticed later. People at the time were aware something strange was going on with these women in Boston. So in this, in this six decade period, um, a lot of people disregarded convention and they harked back to Abigail Adams, remember the ladies, and did their own thing. For example, a, a woman in Boston created a world-class museum. And that, of course, is our friend Isabella Stewart Gardner. Here's the small section on her. And as you all know, she is the person who created what we now call the Gardner Museum. And it was her private home. And in 1903, she opened it up <coughs> uh, to the public. And, um, and it continued to be open to the public after her death in the 1920s. And uh, she created something amazing uh, that has lived with us to this day. Uh, one of my favorite things is uh, when she had her uh, opening in 1903, all the carriages and horse and carriages came up and all the Boston elite arrived. She had members of the Boston Symphony Orchestra playing for her little party. And the, the food she served, as remembered by a guest, was champagne and donuts. And so the next time I open my museum, I'm going to serve champagne and donuts. Um, a woman in Boston during this period created a hospital by and for women, okay? In other words, 
hospitals were all run by men and even if they sometimes took care of women who they didn't understand all that well uh, because it was Victorian times and that's another story we'll get into later. But many women wanted to be treated by other women and this woman did that and that was Dr. Marie Zekshevska. Yes, that's how you pronounce that name that looks like Zekshevska. Marie Zekshevska. And with the help of other women, including a philanthropist, Edna Dow Cheney, um, she was able to create this hospital. This is today, this was started in 1862, and today it is the Dimmick Center, and it's on the same site. And uh, it was named for this phenomenal surgeon who was a student of hers, uh, named Dr. Susan Dimmick, and some of Okay, hey, Susan, I'm not sure if you can hear us. You seem to be frozen on um, our screen here. So we're just checking in. There oh. are, yes. Oh, I was just saying you froze for a minute on my screen. I don't know if that okay. was the case for other people too, but okay. you're back now. All right. You froze, in the, you froze in the middle of Zakshevska and, and Dimmock. We didn't hear the end of it. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Let me go back. Whoop, let me go back and say that um, uh, one of the prize surgeons at her uh, hospital was Dr. Susan Dimmick. Um, and uh, she is a woman who I'm currently, I've been working for the past four years on the first full length biography of Dr. Dimmick. And <clears throat> that's my project actually at the Women's Studies Research Center. Okay, cool. So we have Mary Baker Eddy creating a world religion. And uh, this of course is the first Church of Christ Scientists, otherwise known as the Christian Science Church. Um, what's very interesting, uh, there's so many comparisons to today, uh, among other things, she was very upset at newspapers of the era and felt that they were just, um, they were just full of, uh, well, it was called yellow journalism. I mean, we had a newspaper gentleman uh, to start a war, you know, the Spanish-American War, things like that. And so to clean up newspapers and make them more accurate and make sure that they were doing things correctly, she created the Christian Science Monitor which exists to this day, um, to combat this yellow journalism and have just serious news. And uh, at the time when she created the newspaper, she was 86 years old. So uh, another extraordinary woman. By the way, just because, and this is a curious thing, just because, uh, let me go back to that for a second. Um, just because these women were creating amazing things didn't necessarily mean that they believed in suffrage or the right to vote. For example, of the three women I told you about, neither Isabella Stewart Gardner nor Mary Baker Eddy were pro-suffrage. They were out there doing independent things that they shouldn't have been doing. They were in the men's sphere. Uh, they were breaking all the rules, but there were women who believed in all kinds of things for women, but thought, nah, not the vote. Dr. Zakshevska, however, on the other hand, was very much a suffragist and believed in that very firmly. And people, wonder how that's possible, you know, that someone could not believe in women getting suffrage or the right to vote and creating wonderful things. But um, just look at today and some people who voted for people, we just can't understand why they voted that way. And it's like, well, so I mean, things don't necessarily line up and make sense all the time. So that's, that's enough of that. Um, anyway, women also, in addition to these three things, during these six decade period, established schools, settlement houses, training programs, journals, businesses, all kinds of opportunities, many for and with other women. They grouped together to do this. Uh, a name you've probably all heard of, Julie Ward Howe. Um, people uh, generally associate, if they only know one thing about her, they know that she wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Um, that's actually a wonderful story. Um, the, the uh, the, the actual song, you know, my eyes have seen the glory, etc. The actual song, she stole the tune, but all of that came out of the Boston area. She was living in Boston, but uh, George's Island out in Boston Harbor uh, had Fort Warren in it. And Fort Warren was a civil war fort that was uh, being used to protect us from any kind of invasion of the Confederacy. It was also used as a Confederate jail. And while the guys were out, 
out there. They were actually building it during the Civil War. It wasn't done in time for the war. But the Union troops that were out there were building it, and they had songs. The troops always had songs to work by, and they actually wrote the song John Brown's Body, which you probably all know has the same tune as the Battle Hymn of the Republic. John Brown's body lies a molden in the grave, etc. I'm not a singer, sorry. Um, anyway, so uh, these soldiers brought this tune along. It was really fun to march to, John Brown's Body. And Julia Ward Howe actually overheard them. Actually, at the time, they weren't even in Boston. They were marching in DC. And she heard it and chased after them and went, oh, I love that tune. And then she wrote the words, Battle Hymn, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory, to that. And it was published and it became like the anthem of the Civil War. So all of that grew out of Boston and Julia Ward Howe. But she was much more than that. Um, she was a suffragist. She was an abolitionist. Uh, she was very, very important in the building of women's organizations, women's clubs and groups, um, suffrage organizations in Massachusetts, etc. She also created the first Mother's Day. Now, the modern Mother's Day we have today uh, was created in 1914 by a woman named Anna Jarvis in memory of her mother, <clears throat> who also was a very strong independent woman. Um, however, the first Mother's Day was in Boston and Julia Ward Howe made it. This was back in 1872. And uh, are we okay there? I just got a note that my connection was unstable. Are we all right? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Yeah. Occasionally there's a bit of a, a, once in a while, just a little bit of a um, dropout, okay. um, but uh, minor. Okay, all right. So if it, ha I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just keep talking and then you tell me or yell if something happens, okay? Um, anyway, so in 1872, we had finished the Civil War, the Franco-Prussian War was just over, and the world knew about both of these wars, and they were two incredibly bloody wars, and created much grief and sorrow, and too many, too many young men dying. And she decided that mothers, of all people, didn't want their husbands, their sons, their brothers, etc., going to war and dying, and she wanted to have a political statement behind Mother's Day. So she created the Mother's Day for Peace. It began in Boston. Other cities and states began adopting it. And for much of the decade, this was celebrated as Mother's Day. And it happened to be on June 2nd. And I know that because it's my birthday. Not 1872, however, June 2nd. Uh, but this is a big deal. Anyway, among the many things this amazing person did. You probably know this woman, Louise May Alcott. Um, Louisa May Alcott, um, although, you know, you're going to say, hey, wait a sec, Boston. Um, yes, she wrote Little Women when she was in Concord, but she, um, her family moved a lot. And her dad, I think when, with her family, her dad, Bronson Alcott, her sisters, her mom, they lived in something like two dozen different places. And Louisa May actually lived a great deal uh, in Boston itself, especially on Beacon Hill. Uh, you can still visit her old home on, on Louisburg Square. Anyway, one of my favorite stories about her is, of course, she was an aspiring writer, did lots of what were called blood and thunder stories about things that she never experienced, but she thought it was really fun. And the big publisher in town that everybody wanted to go to was Tickner and Fields in the old corner bookstore. And Jamie Fields was uh, the A&R guy there, and he, would, he was known for sussing out talent. And Louisa May Alcott came in and brought a manuscript to him, and he looked at it, and at the time, she was doing other jobs. She was being a school teacher at the time. And uh, he looked at the manuscript and just kind of shook his head and gave her $40. And he said, take this $40 um, and use it for whatever you need in the classroom, uh, chairs, books, etc." I guess $40 went a lot farther then than it does now. And uh, told her to do that. And then he said, you know, stick to your teaching. Several years later, when uh, Little Women was published uh, by Roberts Brothers, another publisher in Boston, she uh, sent a note to Jamie Fields uh, uh, with $40 and said, uh, you said that I should return this money when I find my pot of gold. Well, I have found my pot of gold. Now, it's important to note, however, the manuscript she had given him was not Little Women. It was another manuscript, but he just didn't think she was a writer, but she persisted. And I think that's true with all of these women. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth Warren. She did persist. Okay, another, another Boston wonder, um, Fanny Farmer. 
Um, Fanny Farmer, we all know, I know uh, when I was growing up, my mother always had the Fanny Farmer cookbook. Um, the real name was the Boston Cooking School cookbook, but everybody called it the Fanny Farmer. And uh, anyway, Fanny uh, was born in Boston, but she grew up in Medford and she was going to Medford High School. And uh, when she was uh, 16, she had a paralytic, uh, stru well, she became paralyzed. Um, and uh, she was disabled and wasn't able to get around and wasn't able to continue school. So she stayed home with her mom and took up cooking. And she got so good at cooking that they spread it out and had a boarding house and fed the people there. And everyone realized she was very talented. And now down in downtown Boston, some women had gotten together and created the Boston Cooking School. And Mary Lincoln was its first, uh, no relation to Mary Todd Lincoln. Mary Lincoln was its first uh, director. And Fanny became a student there, became the star student, and eventually took over as the director. And uh, she put out this book, cookbook in 1896. Um, nobody thought it was going to be much of anything. In fact, Little Brown, uh, which was in Boston at the time, published it, but made her pay for the first production. And it just, it sold like crazy. This has never been out of print. This is a copy uh, of the Centennial Edition. It's in many, many languages around the world. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is one of the things that Fanny Farmer did was she was called the mother of le level measurement because you've probably heard people say um, prior to that time people would say oh uh, do a sift a little of this do a pinch of that um, a dollop of that and it weren't it wasn't exact measurements and she said you know some people can do that but the average woman simply can't do that and she needs to know this should be a level tablespoon and this should be a cup, whatever. And so that's what she institutionalized was level measurements so everybody could have things turn out uh, perfectly. Um, people adored her. She eventually left and ran her own school in Boston. Um, she had a column, uh, uh, a column that she wrote months in advance, as many columnists do, because it was ideas about recipes and food and health and all that. And uh, when she died, the newspaper where her column ran was so mortified uh, that people would be so upset that Fanny Farmer was dead that they continued to run her column for months after her death and did not tell anyone that she was dead. Could not get away with that today. Could not, could not get away with that today. Um, somebody, the last time I gave this lecture said, we should have done that with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We shouldn't have told anybody. I, okay, just go on from there. By the way, <clears throat> when I was a kid, we also used to have Fanny Farmer candies. You will notice the spelling, okay? I'm gonna look at the previous slide. Fanny I-E, Fanny Farmer Candies with a Y. That's because it had nothing to do with Fanny Farmer. This was a company who wanted to uh, cash in on the fame of Fanny Farmer and how beloved she was. And so they, they could not use her real name and they used her fake name. Now, someone asked me last time I gave this lecture, then how come they used her picture? I have no idea how they got away with that. Okay, but it had nothing to do with her. It came out several years after her death. Another person, very, very important during this, this period, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin. And uh, this image on the left, this uh, bas-relief, is uh, actually in the Massachusetts uh, State House. Um, it's part of uh, a six-woman uh, statue um, called Hear Us uh, that went up a little over, uh, probably almost 25 years ago. And uh, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin uh, created a club called the Women's Era that was for African-American women in Boston. And women read it all across the nation. She created the club, she also created the newspaper. And um, this was a period when many Boston women bonded together through clubs and clubs had different purposes and different focuses. Some were political, some were social. And she was an important link between the black women's clubs and the white women's clubs. And uh, so she was a rather astonishing person, which is one of the reasons why she is remembered uh, at the State House. Uh, a recent development, um, her daughter, and I mistakenly said this was Florida Ruffin Ridley, but I found out that she pronounced it Florida Ruffin Ridley. Anyway, she was her daughter and she took over editing uh, and being in charge of the Women's Journal uh, along with her mom and then after her mom passed. 
but she also was very, very important um, in uh, working against lynching, an activist against lynching. Uh, she was also a suffragist, uh, journalist, etc., and uh, one of the first African Americans, if not the first, to teach in, in Boston schools. And curiously, just uh, the end of September, a school in Boston was named for Florida. And uh, some of you may know the Coolidge Corner School. School. It was called the Edward Devotion School, or just the Devotion School for years. Um, and it was one of those cases where they discovered, they went back into the history and discovered old Ed Devotion was a slaveholder. And so uh, it was like, okay. And then the town decided, Brookline decided to, uh, um, they would go over some other names and thought Florida would be a very, very fitting person. So this is all brand new. This was just six weeks ago that this was uh, brought to fruition. Lucy Stone. Lucy Stone is the most unsung of suffrage heroes. And she was in Boston. She actually was born in West Brookfield, but spent much of her time in Boston. She was a suffragist. Um, she was uh, as important, if not more important, than the people who were getting all the credit this year, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, because, well, for a variety of reasons. Lucy was actually involved in suffrage before them. She was the one that got Susan B. Anthony involved in suffrage. She also got Julia Ward Howe involved in suffrage. She was the person who ran uh, the very, or who helped organize the very first national women's suffrage conference. And in Boston, diagonally across from this, uh, from the state house on Park Street, she set up the offices of the Women's Journal in 1870, along with her husband, Henry Blackwell. And this became probably the most significant of all the suffrage journals. And she would work not only to work for suffrage, but to support lots of other women's organizations. So when a woman's club or school or store or um, whatever came into being, she would promote it, she would write about it, she would make sure everyone knew about it. Um, she was uh, a rebel in many, many ways. When she married Henry Blackwell, they had a very unusual wedding. She said she would not take his last name because that was absurd and she kept her own name. So he was Henry Blackwell, she was Lucy Stone. Um, after that, any woman who did that uh, was called a Lucy Stoner for many, many years. She was uh, one of the first women in New England to get a college degree. She was the first, uh, probably the first person in New England to get cremated. I know that doesn't seem like a big deal, but <laughs> she just had all kinds of firsts. The reason we haven't heard about her as much as Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton is that there was a huge break um, in, uh, in the women's movement for suffrage. And it broke into two parts. They were, the two of them were on one side, Lucy was on the other. And a lot of it had to do with uh, the disenchant, or the whether or not to work for, uh, for the 15th Amendment, allowing uh, African-American men to vote. And, and uh, Lucy said, let's work on that first and then we'll get back to women. And uh, Anthony and Stanton said, no, 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 push that aside. Um, they were racist, uh, but they also uh, were the people who wrote the book. And when they wrote the history of women's suffrage, essentially Lucy Stone was written out. Um, so I'm here promoting Ra Ra Lucy Stone as important as them. Now, speaking of her, contemporary rethinking of pedestals. Let's bring this back to what I was talking about before. This is sculptor Meredith Bergman. She is standing here with our friend Abigail Adams, much like Abigail. Meredith is the person who uh, was the sculptor chosen to create the Boston Women's Memorial, which is on the Commonwealth Avenue Mall on the Fairfield Gloucester block. Uh, here, speaking of blocks, they are putting in the Lucy Stone stone. Now what Meredith did, knowing, are we okay? Okay. What Meredith did, knowing about women and pedestals and constraints, this is me with Lucy there, Okay, the, uh, the Women's Memorial includes Lucy Stone, Abigail Adams, and Phyllis Wheatley. Um, there's Lucy Stone and uh, a youngster trying to relate to her <laughs> or contact her. And this is the Boston Women's Memorial. What Meredith did was she was well aware of the cult of true womanhood and pedestals and their restraints. So she created pedestals 
And on each of them, she has the woman's name, words that she wrote, because all three of these women were important for their writing. Phyllis Wheatley, the first published, uh, the first African-American woman to publish a book of poems. Abigail Adams, we already know about her uh, very, very long correspondence, uh, which is all held by the Mass Historical Society, um, and the importance of her writing. She has the Remember the Ladies quote there, Lucy Stone with the Women's Journal. And instead of having the women on the pedestals, Meredith put them working on them. They're writing on them, leaning on them, using them for strength, not standing upon them. So it was a total rethinking of the idea of pedestals. Curiously, uh, just to get into contemporary stuff, that, by the way, the Women's Memorial went up in 2003. And uh, so we're going to have its 20th anniversary in three years. Wow. Meredith also, this summer, was the same person who, if you read about the new women's statue, Monumental Women, in uh, Central Park in New York City, she created that as well. And in that case, we have Anthony and Stanton, okay, um, as well as Sojourner Truth. And uh, this was dedicated at the end of August. So, uh, uh, and I don't know why they're on pedestals. Don't ask me. I get, you know, you have to work it out with whoever you're doing this for. So, uh, uh, whatever. What's interesting is when they, um, when there are competitions like this, what they do is if there's a public statue in New York, Boston, whatever, uh, there are competitions and people put in small, usually um, clay sculptures of their idea um, and uh, some kind of commission, an art commission makes the decision and then they get the commission to, to make that statue and it becomes bronze or whatever. Um, when this was first requested, it was just Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And this is what the original one looked for. And then there was the realization um, that it was not inclusive. And so uh, they wisely decided to add Sojourner Truth, at which point Meredith, who's, who had the idea, um, went back and recreated the statue um, to make it uh, inclusive. Boston, of course, was inclusive from the start. All right, because <laughs> whatever. Okay, the next person, Amy Cheney Beach. Amy Cheney Beach, an amazing person, an amazing musician. Um, she made her fame in Boston. She, I, I have to read you this uh, because she was a, a musical prodigy. Uh, I can never remember the years. She sang improvised harmony parts at age two. She composed at age four. She began piano studies with her mother at age six. And she gave her first public recital at seven. And when she was 13, she wrote The Rainy Day, which was her first published song. And she wrote that, um, she wrote that after her visit with Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, of course, because don't all little girls do that. Um, anyway, she was quite phenomenal, uh, a pianist. She wrote she, more than 300 different pieces from small songs to orchestral arrangements and everything in between. She married a guy named H.H.A. Beach, who was a doctor. He was 24 years older than her. And uh, um, he was not, wild about her being out there in the world because women shouldn't do that. Um, he was, so uh, he didn't want her teaching piano. He didn't want her performing. And so she pulled back. The only positive, uh, the only positive aspect of what, that was that she composed more because she would stay at home per his preference, uh, which was kept her kind of in the women's sphere. But after he died, she went out and started performing and performed around the world, kept composing and really blossomed. Um, I've been a, a board member and an advocate for and an advisor for the Boston Women's Heritage Trail for, uh, I don't know, 25 years now. And one of my colleagues there, Leanne Curtis, who's also a colleague at the Women's Studies Research Center, um, was part of a campaign uh, and helped spearhead the campaign to make the hat shell more inclusive. Um, because if you've been to the hat shell, you, you will see all these names here, um, Monteverde, Dvorak, List, etc. There are 88 names or 87 names uh, of famous composers. And guess what? They're all guys. So since we have Amy Beach, who was the first woman to compose uh, a piece that was performed by a symphony orchestra, Orchestra, the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Um, one of her pieces was early performed by the Handel and Haydn Society, etc. Um, because she was so significant internationally and in Boston, um, a group got together, Leanne connected with um, 
uh, uh, just a, a, an amazing number of people involved in music, um, as well as Keith Lockhart, which was convenient. And, um, and they got Amy Beach's name. And you can see on the bottom, okay, so she's not facing forward. Those, those, those spaces were taken, but you can see right above Chopin Beach is in there. So uh, Amy finally got her due. Um, another very interesting person you may not have heard about, Edmonia Lewis. Um, Edm Edmonia Lewis was the first African-American woman um, to become known in the inter international art scene. She was actually of both African-American and uh, Native American heritage. I believe it was Ojibwe. And um, she was uh, somewhat of a mystery woman. To this day, uh, there are all kinds of her things about her life, including the year she was born, where she died, etc., that are kind of unknown. She was a little bit mysterious, but she took up in Boston and became very, very um, connected to not only the suffragists, the abolitionists, people in the progressive circles. Um, one of the best known sculptures she did was this image of Robert Gould Shaw, who was the famous colonel who led the all black um, 54th um, regiment. Uh, that the big statue of him, of course, is uh, the St. Gaudens across from the uh, the State House. Um, this particular uh, bust that she made, which is now in the Museum of African American History on Beacon Hill, um, this particular bust uh, uh, made her so much money. It was very common in those times if you if you made a bust and people liked it, then you would make miniature models and sell them. And she made so much money from that that she was able to go to Italy and spend much of her life there in artist colonies in Italy. But uh, uh, an extraordinary talent, she, had a, uh, she was in the artist building on Tremont Street, where many of the very famous, mostly male artists um, used to work. Um, and uh, uh, she, these are a couple of other pieces of hers. Um, again, very political and very progressive. The left was about slavery and freedom. The right was about the Native American heritage. So she did a lot of a lot of pieces like that. A very extraordinary woman. Another artist in Boston who was doing amazing things or things that other people didn't do was Anne Whitney. And even though she started out as a poet, she did take up sculpture and became rather amazing at it. Um, you know very well two of her pieces. The Sam Adams, which stands by Faneuil Hall, is by her. And that's actually a copy of, of the Sam Adams that she was commissioned to do in the 1870s that went uh, into the Capitol in Washington, DC. Every state was allowed to send two statues in of famous people or heroes from their states. And so we chose Sam Adams and we also chose Ann Whitney to do that. So this is a copy of that. Uh, and on the right, one of my favorites at Charles Kate is Leif Erikson watching for the fly balls at uh, Fenway Park. And um, I, it's a wonderful statue. People have often said, why do we have a statue of Leif Erikson uh, in Boston? And that's because this wonderful lunatic named Evan Horsford honestly believed that the Vikings came to Cambridge um, and wanted to commemorate that in many ways. And so he actually paid for this, uh, for Ann Whitney to create this Leif Erikson. Um, if you ever go over the Salt and Pepper Bridge, um, uh, the Longfellow Bridge, I don't know if you ever looked at the sides, but the bases um, between the inlets where you, the boats go through are made to look like um, uh, Viking ships. And that's also Evan Horsford and uh, the Vikings coming to Cambridge. There is no evidence the Vikings came to Cambridge, but hey, here's Leif. Now, one of the one of the things that she fought against uh, uh, the sexism of the era and people being unclear about what sphere you should be in. Uh, this is a statue in the public garden of Charles Sumner. Charles Sumner was an extraordinary senator uh, from Massachusetts, a very strong abolitionist. He was also a suffragist. Very often, people in Boston were both. It was often hand in hand abolitionists and suffragists. And so they had one of those blind competitions and a variety of artists in town submitted small clay statues. And um, the one that won, the one that they thought was by far the most beautiful and telling was by Ann Whitney. And uh, it was a seated statue of Sumner. 
And Anne had a particular thing. She really loved Sumner, first of all, because he represented all she believed in, all the progressive thoughts, abolitionism, fighting for what was right. But also, Charles had gone to Harvard with her brother, Alexander, and they were really good friends, and her brother died. And so in some ways, Sumner to her was kind of represented her brother, and she had a strong emotional attachment. Well, when the Boston Art Commission chose it, it was a blind competition, and then they looked and said it was by Anne Whitney. And uh, they went, oh, and uh, decided that it was inappropriate for a woman to sculpt a statue of a man because a woman shouldn't know anything about male anatomy, like she shouldn't be able to mold a man's legs because she shouldn't know what that is like. And therefore, they pushed hers aside and chose this one by Thomas Ball. And uh, that's the one that's there today. Later, again, uh, when she was in her 80s, much older, she really, really wanted her statue to be seen because she loved it. And so she personally took care to get her statue cast, and you can still see it in Harvard Square, where she had it put together and assembled. And this is near the, uh, the turnaround for the tea in Harvard Square, and there is Anne Whitney's Charles Sumner, so she did, in fact, get it up, but not where it should have been. If you get to look at these more closely, you can see even better how much more beautiful hers is than silly Thomas Balls. Okay. All right, we've got a couple of Hemingways coming up here. This is Harriet. Harriet Hemingway um, was a lovely woman, uh, was a socialite, had a cousin named Minna Hall, and they became obsessed with a fashion thing that was happening with women in Boston in the 1890s. And the fashion thing was that women had a lot of bird feathers on their hats. In fact, if you look closely, women had a lot of birds on their hats, okay? Um, this is, I mean, entire birds, okay? The problem was, all kinds of birds, particularly, let me get, make sure I get these all right, woodpeckers, bluebirds, owls, herons, and warblers, were being shot and killed by the tens of thousands to make women's hats. And they decided, this is bad, we're going to lose our bird population if we don't, don't stop, if this doesn't stop. So, um, so Harriet and her, and her cousin um, decided to begin having teas with their socialite friends, trying to convince women to stop wearing feathers in their hats and stop wearing birds. And they succeeded. And women started, this whole movement began because of these two women and their teas. And this eventually, this led directly actually to the creation of the Mass Audubon Society and all kinds of laws protecting birds. Um, and uh, by the way, the Mass Audubon Society was the first Audubon Society in the United States um, and later inspired the creation of the National Audubon Society. And there's still a, Mass Audubon has a plaque to Harriet Hemingway down there. By the way, if you've ever been on Hemingway Street, that is named specifically for Harriet. She also had a very powerful mother-in-law, and that would be Mary Hemingway. Mary Hemingway was probably the richest woman in Boston in the late 19th century. Uh, her husband had been a merchant. She uh, uh, took the money and gave it to all kinds of wonderful things. And one of the most wonderful things she did was she helped save the Old South Meeting House. Now, some of you may be aware or confused by the fact that there is an Old South Meeting House and an Old South Church. The Old South Meeting House is down on uh, Washington at the base of School Street, whereas the Old South Church is in Copley Square. So what's the difference? Um, the Old South congregation used to be down here in the meeting house. In 1872, there was a great fire and a whole lot of Boston burned down. The, the fire, in fact, you know, hundreds of buildings, hundreds of acres, whatever. Right behind the Old South and right next to the Old South, the fire stopped. That wasn't an accident. It was because huge numbers of people realized the Old South was so important to Boston history and uh, was the place where the, uh, the Boston Tea Party began, where all kinds of meetings with patriots happened. It was just a really essential linchpin in our history and they wanted to save it. Um, but afterwards, there were also, there's all kinds of building in the Back Bay and many institutions that used to be downtown wanted to move out to the Back Bay and the Old South congregation did that. And so even though this had been saved, within a few years, the threat of the wrecking ball came. 
But Mary Hemingway decided she was going to fight that. And so she got together her most influential friends. She also dropped down herself $100,000 to help save this and preserve it as a museum, as a historic building. Um, and uh, $100,000 was a lot of money then, a lot of money then. In fact, it was probably at least a quarter of what they needed to save this building. Anyway, so uh, uh, she got together a lot of people, including people we've talked about before, Louise May Alcott, Julie Ward Howe, all the prestigious people to give speeches, talks, give donations to save the Old South. One of my favorite stories regarding the saving of the Old South involved another woman. And this is um, Mary and her little lamb. Okay, here is a, a picture of the, the poem that you know, or the song you know, uh, either one very, very well. Um, Mary Sawyer, there really was a Mary, and she really lived in Massachusetts. She was actually from Sterling. This is a picture I took at the Sterling Historical Society because that was her dress as an adult. And um, the story really happened, and it was made into a poem by a one John Rolls. Um, it was published uh, in magazines and newspapers, became a song, and it became very popular. And you know, one of the favorite uh, children's songs and, and poems of all times. But Mary Sawyer was still alive when Mary Hemingway was uh, changing or trying to save the Old South. And so what she did was when that little lamb followed her to school, she kept the little lamb. It was a little disabled lamb that uh, she took care of and nursed to health. And uh, she used to shear it and make things out of it like socks. So she still had several pairs of socks. This is like 60 years later. Um, and so she unraveled the socks and put them into little cards and sold them to fundraise for the Old South. And you can see it says knitted yarn from the first um, fleece of Mary's Little Lamb. Okay, and in 1880, she gave this, and it was one of the fundraising things that women did to save the Old South. One of my favorite stories involves these guys, the swans and the swan boats. Um, they created the public garden uh, and we're trying to create uh, all kinds of wonderful things. And when the public garden was created, because all of that is made land, um, one of the things they did was create a three foot deep lagoon. And um, there was a gentleman named Robert Paget, uh, who was an Irish immigrant, who got from the city of Boston the, um, the concession to have rowboats on, uh, on the lagoon. And so he had a rowboat concession and was rowing people around. And uh, then in 1877, he, two things made him start rethinking what he was taking people around in. Number one was in the 1870s, this new newfangled thing called the flying velocipede, AKA bicycles was all the rage. And he saw people going through town on their bicycles, moving things by just moving their, their, their feet around a wheel. He and his wife, Julia also went to New York and saw Wagner's Lundgren. And with this scene that apparently affected him, where this knight of the Holy Grail is taken across a lake by a swan to save his lady. So we put these two things together, the petals and the swans, and, uh, and we have the swan boats. And so Robert Paget and his wife Julia did, in fact, create the swan boats um, that we still know today. Um, a lot of people think that this is run by the city of Boston. It is still run by the Paget family. It was run then and it's still run today. Now, the thing is, Robert got all the credit in the history books for many, many years. However, Robert only lived for a year uh, once the swan boats were founded. He died a year later. And here was his wife, Julia, with four kids and wanted to make a living to support these kids. And so she took over. And for the next 36 years, the swan boats were run by a woman except women weren't allowed to run businesses. And so she had to get, while she's in the midst of running this, um, even though she's not allowed to, she's making a living, supporting the kids, um, doing a bang up business. Uh, she had to get affidavits from men office, men business owners in the area to say, yes, indeed, she can do this and she can do it very well, even though she's a woman and in the men's sphere. So she continued to do that. What I love, oh, here's one of the early swan boats. They had smaller capacity. And there's Julia again. Um, and here's the uh, entry about her from, from the Atlas. 
And in 2011, a bunch of us got together, the Women's Commission, the Boston Women's Heritage Trail, et cetera, and brought Julia's uh, story to light and also um, got the swan boats to be made into uh, an official uh, Boston landmark. And here we are. This is uh, very curiously, if the, if the picture on the right, there's Sue Goganian, who was the head of the Women's Heritage Trail at the time, and Lynn Paget, who is the great, great dan granddaughter of Julia Paget, who is running the swan boats today. So uh, women are still strong. She's running it with her cousin. Okay, the question here is, we've got women doing things that they're not supposed to be doing all over the place and succeeding all over the place. Why did this happen in Boston? Some theories. One of them is our education, okay? Boston has been known for its phenomenal education since day one. The town was founded in 1630. Five years later, we had the first public school in America, Boston Latin. A year after that, we had the first college in British North America, that was Harvard, okay? So we're talking about within six years of our founding, we had schools, okay? Schools and colleges. Education was always very, very important. And so um, this is going to affect men as well as women. Obviously, men were the first ones who were educated, but slowly they allowed women to do that too. They would become good wives if they were well-educated. But it's a good way to sneak in. You get educated, you know more. It's not that big a step from a woman being a student to doing well as a student and then become a teacher. It's kind of a sly way to move your way in and to move up. So more so than other cities and other towns. And these are just some samples of, uh, in the upper right, the Women's Educational and Industrial Union, uh, Paul Revere Pottery in the North End, uh, helping immigrant girls, um, colleges, upper left, that was from Wheelock, and uh, the lower left, um, Girls Latin. So uh, different ways of women learning skills and uh, things that took them outside of, this, uh, out of the women's sphere. Another thing that people don't think about is we just had wretched land. I mean, if you've ever dug in your garden, the stones are awful. You know, it's not like we're in uh, Virginia or even parts of Connecticut. Um, there, we didn't have very good agricultural productivity. And so um, women moved into industrialized areas. Uh, one of the, the perfect examples of this are the Lowell Mill Girls who back in the 1830s and 40s left the farm and went to work in the mills. And while they were there, went to lectures and classes and wrote, and all of a sudden we see women escaping. So the lack of opportunities on farmland really affected that. I just put these here because I love these pictures. I just love these women on the farm and digging up that stuff. <laughs> Recent activism. This is because uh, of what had been happening in Boston before the Civil War and during the Civil War. Um, a lot of women, in Boston in particular, I mean, it, it's not like it didn't happen in other cities, but we had a phenomenal amount, were involved in abolitionism. Um, I just wanted to mention that many abolitionists, people fighting against slavery, were white men who wanted to do it alone. William Lloyd Garrison was in Boston and he was very unusual in that he, he encouraged women to join the abolitionist circles as well as people of color. And it's hard to believe that people didn't want women and people of color in their abolitionist circles, but many didn't. But in Boston, we did. Uh, women were involved in Boston in temperance uh, and also all kinds of things, soldiers' aids groups helping during the Civil War. Uh, uh, Louise May Alcott was one of those. You know, in Little Women, her father goes down to fight in the Civil War. Um, he didn't go down. Her, in, in real life, her father didn't go down. She went down and helped with uh, medical groups um, and precursors to the American Red Cross. Uh, so women were doing all this. So they were already out there because women were needed to do things during the Civil War. And it's gonna be, you know, it's your literal, how are you gonna keep them down on the farm? Phenomena. And so here are just um, various instances of women going out there doing charity work, being there in the Civil War and being in the men's sphere, the public sphere. Now, this is a tricky one. You can get into the men's sphere if you make it look like you're not, okay? So if women are going into the pu public sphere in jobs that kind of look like what they were doing at home, maybe they won't notice. Think of, and I've listed here, things like nursing. Well, women do that at home. You're gonna notice it when they go out. 
cooking. Okay, so that you go from cooking to opening kitchens and uh, having cooking schools, whatever. Okay, benevolent work, childcare moves into teaching, sewing moves into factories where people are sewing and knitting, etc. So all of those are just ways of sneaking in and suddenly you're outside the home and doing other things and experiencing the bigger world and people maybe didn't notice too much. And these are various examples um, of women in these various fields outside of the home. Um, Boston had a huge amount of immigration, especially starting in the 1840s with the Irish, but then many, many other groups coming after that in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And um, this was part patronizing and part benevolent. Um, people were concerned, well, we've got to be, make these people good citizens. We need to Americanize them, so we need to edu educate them and train them. But at the same time, they're in the cities, they're learning more, they're bonding with other people, and suddenly you have a whole other thing happening. Uh, so we've got women entering the workforce. And this is in the North End. There were many groups made for immigrants in the North End. At that time, most of the immigrants were uh, Jewish and Italian. And uh, this is Paul Revere Party, uh, Paul Revere Pottery, excuse me, uh, where immigrant girls were taught tasks. By the way, much of this pottery is now um, featured at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Family wealth. In the 19th century, a lot of Boston families got rich, okay? And very often, women would be uh, the recipients of this if your father died, if your husband died, etc. cetera. Uh, in the case of Isabella Stewart Gardner, she got money from her, um, both from her late husband as well as from her wealthy family, and that enabled her to do much of what she was doing. And the Dow Cheney was another example of that. Um, and so very often, many of these women put them into women's enterprises and supported other women. Here are the two women I was talking about, Mrs. Gardner and Mrs. Cheney. And, uh, okay, I added we can do it on the bottom. Um, sisterhood. The men, this is a gross generalization, and I'm going to make it. Often the men tended to be rugged individuals. This guy is doing this, this guy is doing this. But very often, women were doing things in groups, organizations. Um, they were sharing things, they were sharing letter, literacy, they were working to help other women. They were doing things together as groups and sometimes their individual names are not even known because we just know the organization that they created. Um, and so uh, I like this because this is the yayas. But anyway, um, women doing things for each other, helping other women to succeed and get out there at what they're doing. So I want to give you a small microcosm of this uh, based on the book that I'm working on, on the history of uh, Dr. Susan Dimmick. And here's just an example of how all these different things come together, all these different aspects of why Boston come together in one particular place. So first of all, um, Here's a picture of the New England Hospital for Women and Children. It's in Roxbury. It's the Dimmick Center today, and the founder was Dr. Zakshevska, who we'll call Dr. Zak because no one can pronounce Zakshevska. Um, this was the second hospital in the United States after one in New York that was created by women with women doctors and women nurses working with women patients. And it filled a gigantic need. Um, and uh, Regarding immigrants, okay, Dr. Zach was in fact an immigrant. Um, she came from Germany, um, had studied midwifery there. Her mother had been a midwife because that was acceptable. Women couldn't be doctors. She came here though and was helped out by the Blackwell sisters in New York who created the first hospital by and for women with Dr. Zach's help. And then they got her in the back door of a, host of a, a teaching hospital at Western Reserve and uh, where she was taught to be a doctor and got her doctor's degree, even though women weren't allowed in mixed or men's colleges to get medical degrees. Um, she was involved in prior things. She was a strong suffragist. She was also a strong abolitionist. And therefore she connected with a lot of powerful men who supported women. Uh, so some men were very much against women joining the public sphere. Um, some, women were, uh, some men were very much for them. Here's William Lloyd Garrison on the left, Theodore Parker, James Freeman Clark, 
all of them were movers and shakers, uh, were for women's rights, for suffrage, for abolitionism, and they worked together um, helping these women create what they wanted. Women supporting other women. They saw this young woman, Susan Dimmick, who came from the South. They saw that she was a prodigy. And uh, Dr. Dr. Zach and several of the other women at the hospital said, this woman is good. We need to get her the best education possible. And so uh, they wanted to send her to Harvard Med because that was, that's Harvard Med on the left. Um, but Harvard said, you know, there's nothing in our rules that say we can accept women. And there's nothing in our rules that say we can't accept women. So no, we can't accept you. Susan Dimmick applied um, to Harvard Med in 1867. Harvard Med started accepting women, you ready? In 1945. Okay, so she was just 78 years ahead of her time. Uh, anyway, they made this discovery, the women supporting her, we've got to get education, this will make a difference. This will mean she could be an actual doctor and MD. And uh, so they found out that in Zurich, Switzerland, they were having an experiment um, and were allowing uh, just a few women in to join the men in the med school. She got an amazing education and she came back and became the resident physician at the New England Hospital for Women and Children. There, and this is another case of women supporting women and getting in slyly with other types of uh, things that looked like the domestic sphere, she professionally the first professional training school for nurses in the US. Prior to that, nurses, it was kind of like you hung out, you, um, you, know, you worked with another nurse or you worked with a doctor and learned on the job, kind of like apprenticing. There was no real school, no lectures, no teaching, whatever. And so she created a one-year course that was both practical and book studying. And it's the first nurses training school in the US. And uh, her first student was Linda Richards, who to this day is like the godmother of all nurses. Um, and she became the first professional trained nurse in the US. That's her diploma, which is uh, at the Smithsonian. They also graduated the first African-American nurse in America, Mary Eliza Mahoney. So this all came out of the New England Hospital. Um, okay, other aspects where they're a microcosm, family wealth. One of the people who, uh, who helped jumpstart the New England Hospital and used her family wealth and connections to do that was Edna Dow Cheney, who again gave her money to so many women's causes in the 19th century. We already discussed this, the blurring of the spheres. Susan Dimmick's teaching this first generation of professional nurses, but they're okay, they're just taking care of people and that's what you do at home. Now, I love this. Remember before I mentioned that <clears throat> women entering careers that are supposedly manly, and medicine was a man's career, were called unsexed and manly. Dr. Dimmick, unfortunately, they couldn't pin it on her. And all the words being used at the time to describe her, utmost femininity, peculiar sweet voice, gentle yet firm expression, ladylike, engaging manners. Um, I have to say they also said she ran the hospital like a little Napoleon, but she was, <laughs> she just didn't fit the stereotype of a professional woman. You know, they wanted you to look like, um, they wanted you to have the battle axe with you. Sisterhood. Again, I make reference. These women knew each other, many of these women and supported each other. So Lucy Stone down on Park Street across from the, uh, across from the State House is promoting, the New England Hospital is promoting Susan Dimmick, Dr. Zach and promoting uh, suffrage for everyone. So they're trying to, everyone's trying to move each other up. So how did this end up in Boston? Well, the upshot is while they thought women were sitting around having tea, okay, they weren't. Well, some of them were, or the ones having tea were convincing people not to have birds on their heads. Anyway, all we have all these women in Boston from different classes helping each other. We have women with experience in other socio-political movements, um, and they're all moving together and creating a good trouble, good trouble. 1914, one of the hugest parades, the most huge, largest uh, in all of Boston history. Uh, this is passing the Robert Gould Shaw 54th Memorial uh, statue across from the State House. 14,000 women marchers. They estimated 200 to 300,000 spectators coming along to watch them on the side. Every state, every union, every school, every women's club, 
in Massachusetts came and marched in this. And this was one of the reasons I stopped this section with 1914, is after that we have just pure and simple moving towards suffrage and six battle, I mean, they've been battling for suffrage for, you know, <clears throat> six and a half decades already, but it became a concerted battle after that until 1919 and 1920. So we get back to Abigail Adams, and now you know where that statue is, who said, if particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. And so that came to be, and that was indeed the beginning. Okay, thank you very much. That is the end of the lecture. Thank you, Susan. Um, I want to point out that people can submit questions using the chat below. Um, and if you put the question in the chat, we can also unmute you if you want to ask it directly. Okay, and should I stop the share now? Uh, so we can uh, yes, see. I suppose so. Then we can see everybody. Okay. okay. There we are. All right. So let's see if there's some questions here. Oh, come on. There's got to be questions. No, I'm sure there are. I'm looking for the, I'm looking <laughs> oh. for the, uh, the chat. Well, of course. Hello, Susan. I'm Deb's brother. Uh, Oh, oh, are you in, or, wait, you're in Virginia? Virginia, yeah. Oh, I love husband. that. I love that. It was a great thing. I loved every minute of it. Born in Plymouth. So I have some connection to some of that Boston stuff. Oh, I love that. Uh, happy, happy um, 400 years. Yeah, thanks. For, for right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's your, what do you call it? Quad quadricentennial? It's yes. that. If yes, we, yes. Without uh, without COVID, we would have been up uh, for the 400th. But uh, my question is, and maybe I missed it. I had to do something in in the stove. You know, men have to cook now. <laughs> yes. But, uh, about Boston marriages, are you yes. prepared to say anything about that? Sure, sure. Um, a, a Boston marriage. Um, in, in this exact same period, uh, there was a phenomenon called a Boston marriage. And what it was, was that um, two women, uh, and they generally, this was again a class thing. You would have to be self-supporting and therefore everyone that I'm talking about was self-supporting. Um, when two women decided to live together um, and they were treated uh, much like a husband and wife. Um, and they were, uh, during this period, um, it, it had happened a great deal in Boston. Some of the people that I mentioned, uh, Ann Whitney uh, was in a Boston marriage. Um, Susan Dimmick was in a Boston marriage. Dr. Marie Zakshevska was in a Boston marriage. Um, and the most significant other in their life was a woman. Now, the question comes, was this a lesbian relationship? Um, from everything that we know, it ran the spectrum. Um, from uh, best friends, um, to what would be, I mean, the, the term lesbian wasn't even used at that time, um, but uh, to what we would call a modern lesbian relationship, we know that some of them in fact were. Uh, we don't have enough information to tell who everyone was, but it definitely was a spectrum. And I do know from, because this lasted into the uh, 20th century, um, in fact, it lasted until it was accepted um, for, for decades largely by everyone and people would you know come to the house these women would travel together they would uh they would be invited together to parties as a couple um and it began to change with freud in the first decade of the 20th century because freud started talking about sex and suddenly people went oh my god could these women be and uh and boston marriages started to disappear after that because people got um very concerned about what it might mean um but does that does that answer that well enough but yeah. it was it was very accepted, um, and I've later learned that there was uh, that in Wellesley, they at Wellesley College, the same thing happened. And very often, you know, sometimes it was just two women. Keep in mind that I already said that if a woman was professional, um, she was considered manly or unsexed. So if she was doing that and achieving and making money and making a name for herself, many men were threatened by that, and therefore the assumption was a man wouldn't want to marry her. Uh, Lucy Stone married a man, but he was a, he kind of, 
he kind of followed her around. He actually liked that, working for Lucy Stone. He was fine that she didn't take his last name. And he did, he worked for her causes. Um, but a lot of men weren't willing to do that. So anyway, that's the, the short version. Okay, great. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Susan. Sure. Yep. Uh, someone wants to know where this recording will be posted and we'll be posting it on um, the Schwamm Mills website as soon as we can put the recording up. We'll probably put the recording on our YouTube channel. Excellent. Okay. Hi, so people just need to go to the website to find it in the future? Yep. Looks like Jean has a question. Yep. Hi, hi Susan. Uh, from one Boston Women's Heritage tra Trail founder to another, it's great to see you again. Great to and see you too. And thank you so much for mentioning Louisa May Alcott, who along with her Beacon Hill ties, you know, spent a lot of time in the South End. And lots of our South End streets are welcomed her and her mother, who was associated with the early uh, Morgan Memorial. So the South End is proud to mention Louisa May Alcott as a former resident in many different streets. Thank you, and it's great to see you and Thanks. hear from you. Thanks, Thanks. Susan. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, is it Freddie Kay has a question? Hi, thanks. I just, I wanted to say hello. Hi, Freddie. Hi, nice to see you. This was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks. It was really great. And great to see you, Jean. We have not met, I don't think, but I'm such a big fan of the Boston. You won't just talk amongst yourselves now. Oh, no, no, I just love all the people that are here. Awesome. I'm sorry. <laughs> Concentrate on Susan. <laughs> well, I also okay. want to point out that Lynn Paget is on, and I don't know if you knew that, Susan. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I'm so excited. Oh, Lynn, I hope I didn't tell any lies. <laughs> Did I? Lynn, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. No, it, that was fantastic. Um, I can't, I'm so happy to see that it's being recorded because uh, I know that my, my parents, who are still alive and both in their 90s, uh, would be just thrilled to to see this. So uh, I've been trying to get to this lecture since you started. You know, I guess that was pre-COVID, and I'm just so glad it's it's fantastic. You, I could listen to you forever. That was so good, Susan. Thank you so much. I'm really honored that um, Julia was included, and yeah, you nailed it. Great job, Lynn. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, was this the first time ever this COVID summer that the Swan boats did not run? Yeah, it was the oh. first time. Yep. Yeah, I think this was, I, we're, we're 143, I think we finished. So, so yeah, this, this, was, a, this was a really difficult decision, um, you know, for a variety of reasons, but that was in the mix that um, oh. would be it. This would be the first time through world wars and the depression and oh. all the other things that uh, have gone on since the late 1800s. Um, oh. And I love that you mentioned, I mean, you know, when I came back into the business uh, after I, you know, kind of did it as a kid and then came back in, you know, it was, it really struck me that no one knew her story. And I thought, gosh, you know, this guy was only alive for a year um, after the swan boats. He had the rowboats for quite some time. And, and, and I thought, wow, you know, that's, that's really a gem. And gosh, how did she do it? And, you know, I tried to get some of my older uncles to, to you know, tell me anything, I, you know, that they knew. And I wish we knew more about her, but um, I'm so glad that she was included. Thank you. Oh, and, and thank you for all your help in, in digging her out. I remember when I was bugging you, can't you find any pictures of her? We got to blow them up. Let's I know. <laughs> we don't have enough. Yeah, we don't have enough. She's great. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks. That was nice memory that you had the pictures. And for those who didn't uh, know what was going on at the pictures of the swan boats, that was your unveiling of the Boston Women's Heritage Trail map that day, I believe, Susan, that yes, you had done. Yes, yes. That was in and, 2011. And we combined yep. it with Women's Equality Day, which was August 26, which Bella Abzug named it Women's Equality Day for the anniversary of women's suffrage. And uh, for those who don't know, I do work with the Women's Suffrage Celebration Coalition with Suffrage 100 MA. So we were so happy, Lynn, that you agreed that we could put the uh, women, the, the suffrage sashes, the votes for women's sashes on the swan boats. 
Um, and we were sorry too, this was our first year, many years that we weren't able to do that. So we look forward to maybe doing that in the future on Women's Equality Day. Yay. So thank you so much. And, and I will say that now a part of our story is to talk about Julia Pageant and the whole story of the swan boats, which we do every time in our, in our talks as well. Excellent. But don't forget to talk about the bicycles and Lohengrin as well, because that's yes. cool. <laughs> <laughs> and just, uh, there is a question, come on over the chat. Tell us again the title of the book. The book is The Atlas of Boston History. Uh, editor, Nancy Seashull, Nancy F. Seashulls. You can get it at any bookstore and online. It's everywhere. It's University of Chicago Press. Um, I, I know it's it's shockingly cheap because we're talking about we're talking um, here. Let me let me grab a copy. Hold on. <laughs> Can you see how big this is? Yes. Wow. This is one big heavy book. Okay, it's hardbound. It's only forty dollars. <laughs> That's crazy. It's crazy. And as as a matter of fact, last time I gave this in the middle of the lecture, one of the people um, went online and bought it. And she has Amazon Prime, and she got it, including postage, for twenty nine dollars. So I, I can't explain that. But it's you will. Be, this is it's a gem. It's a gem. Oh, and I told you it just won the uh, 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 a big prize, book prize. So it's a it's a cool book, and has much obviously much more in it besides my enterprising women. But that's in there too. Not sure if we have a question from Parish Dobson or not. Oh, I do. How did yep. you know? Hi, Parish. Hi. <laughs> Lovely to see you. This is so fabulous. And uh, great to see you. Thank you so much. As ever, it, lots of wonderful information and you present it so well. Um, okay, so I'm not a big historian, but I just finished reading a great biography of Margaret Fuller, who of course uh -huh. dies before your period for this talk. Yes, but, which oh is my why, God, which, why she's not in here. Yeah, she's, she's, well, she's dead in 1850 and I don't start till 1860. Yeah, <laughs> But I, I'm sure you were tempted to put her in because <laughs> of her extraordinary feminism. Well, actually, and, uh, actually, in my first paragraph, in my first paragraph in the uh, in the intro to this, it does mention that there have been many strong there are strong individual women prior to this time, back to Anne Hutchinson, and I I mentioned Margaret Fuller in that context. But yes. then, but the difference here is we have entire groups of women. Right, and and it's it becomes a wave instead of instead of this individual who's amazing because Abigail Adams amazing too, but it's a different period. But I yeah. but her name's in there, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then I did have this this a little harder question, and I, I maybe didn't pick up on it well enough when you were talking about sure. Lucy Stone's view of suffrage and abolition versus or in comparison to. Susan B. Anthony and, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton's views. Um, and the, I, the, the biggest, all, yeah, no, the biggest single split, split had to do with race. In other <laughs> words, I, if it, once, uh, because many people were abolitionists and suffragists, that often went together. However, um, when women were fighting for suffrage, the war was over. There were people who said, we need to make sure in the wake of the war that we give men, because men are the people who could vote, uh, African-American men the right to vote. And Lucy Stone said, okay, let's, and her gang, um, which became the American Women's Suffrage Asso Association, as opposed to the national, it split into the American and the national. Um, her side said, yes, let's work to get men the vote, and then we can go have women have the vote after that. We can't do it all at once. Let's commit there and then move on. Whereas Anthony and Stanton said, no, the heck with that push that aside, we don't want to deal with that, let's do women. That's being very kind to them. I, as I said before, they were racist, period, end story. That's, that's what I was wanting you to tease out and, and just, but yeah. anyway. Yep. It sounds like a deeper subject, thank you. It, it's, it's a few books, yeah. <laughs> Susan? Yeah? I loved your talk, and I just wanted to say that the Mary of Mary Had a Little Lamb uh, married a man named Columbus Tyler, who was the superintendent of McLean's Hospital when it was in Somerville, you know, in that bullfinch design, what was previously the Barrel Mansion. And she worked alongside her husband. And this is all written up in a book by Alex Beam, the 
Boston oh, Globe columnist. Yes. And the book is called Gracefully Insane. <laughs> and it's That's a, a great wonderful title. book, well worth reading. Excellent, thank you. Thank you so much. And any other questions, people uh, just feel to unmute or raise your hand. Hi, Susan. It's Jesse of Jesse and Arthur. Hi, Jesse. Hi. I'm coming to you from Asheville, North Carolina. And um, I just want to give a little history lesson of our own. I've known Susan for 45 years, maybe a little longer. I don't no, know. No, no, no. Um, longer. <laughs> okay. Um, longer. Uh, of course, you'd know that because you, you seem to know everything. Um, I am absolutely astounded that I have known you for longer than 45 years. And you have all of this. I'm never going to understand you. You have all of this packed in your head. I ha am the least educated in terms of women and all of this lecture stuff um, of anyone, I think, in any of these blocks. Um, but I have to tell you that I am just intrigued, astounded, so proud of you. And I am, um, I, I just don't even know what to say. You're, you're a wizard and we are moving to Boston. Um, you convinced me we're moving to Boston from Asheville, North Carolina. That's <laughs> what I have to say. I love you. See you soon, Jesse and Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> and if there's any other questions, you can raise your hand. That might be it, Ed. Okay. Great. Well, uh, thank you so much, Susan. That was terrific. And we encourage everyone to visit the old Schwa Mill in Arlington, see our special exhibit. In addition to honoring Patricia Fitzmorris, who founded the mill as a museum, we also honor women who did similar things in the Boston area. So we hope you'll come visit. All right, Thank you, very, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much, folks. Thanks for being there, everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you so much. bye.